If you and I, and a city worker, engaged in the practice mm -hmm. that they did, we would be in jail. That's right. And arrested right. and put away. Hello? Since we're a banker, we get special rights. We get special rights in this country. I think it's wrong. 30 seconds. I think it's wrong, and I think it's time that we, the people and the pension interest, the people who are getting pensions because they put money in the bank, say enough is enough. These bankers need to be held responsible and accountable, and we don't want our money in these banks, and we don't want these executives getting a dime more from us. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. I don't believe there's anybody left on the list for general pub public comment. <coughs> Okay. I will then call item one, and at this point I will recuse myself from this item and um, pass the gavel on to Commissioner Driscoll. Why are you recusing yourself? Well, why not? State, state reason. Oh, state reason. Okay. Well, I'm Because I do own a bank stock. Ah. Okay. Which stock? <laughs> you don't have a I don't have any member of the pension. You don't have the answer. I'd like to know which bank you are. Oh, yeah. Oh, Are there any other recusals? It's okay, Steve. Are there any other recusals? I really don't have to make that comment. Are there any other refusals? It doesn't even mean it's any bank here. I would have to the process. Aim away, big stuff. Any other refusals? Excuse you. Uh, we need is there the, any? the president of the of the board is conducting the meeting, and there will be a call from the president of the board or the acting president of the board if there are any other refusals. And we would ask that, as you have shown in the past, that you respect the process and that you re, you know you you preserve the right to be heard. I'm and so myself out of this vote. So I will leave, and I think that's the fair thing to do. And any other commissioner who has that same conflict should do the same. Um, I just wanted to make a statement. I'm Brenda Wright, and I was appointed to this board by Mayor Willie Brown and reappointed by Mayor Gavin Newsom as a private citizen not as an employee of Wells Fargo Bank. I work for Wells Fargo Bank. Please, folks. I work for Wells Fargo, so we'll be recusing myself from this, from this vote. Thank you. But I also wanted to, to note that I am personally offended by the fact that you took personal actions against me up to and including threatening to protest my home. So I would want to let you know that I believe that as you have your rights, I have my rights, and I believe that you have infringed upon my right to serve as a private citizen. Excuse me. Thank you. You'll all have an opportunity to make public comment. Mr. Chair, uh, I don't believe I have a conflict, but I believe I have a disclosure issue I'd like to make. Uh, I have an acquisition of the $11,000 worth of Bank of America securities. I don't believe that that dollar amount, whatever decision comes out today, will materially affect my investment or will materially affect Bank of America's profits or losses. Uh, therefore, I will proceed to sit in the meeting. Board members. <clears throat> okay, folks, we'll start with item one. After the board discusses, there will be a motion. We will then open up the public comment on item one again. Uh, this being a little bit unusual, so if I make a parliamentary mistake, our parliamentarian will stop me. Also, Mr. Norm Dickens will assist because we want you all a chance to feel you had a chance to speak and give us your views on any one of these subjects. Item one. This item was added to the agenda at the request of Commissioner Myberger. Um, he in also drafted the two alternative motions that were embedded in the uh, item. I won't go through the item other than to say that we again, as we will always do when we're considering the social investment policy, we'll focus the board 
on those issues that will make the investment in these banks or these types of companies riskier or considerably riskier than a, a normal investment. And we focus on the investment side, the investment risk, the industry risk, and that's why we wrote the item the way it was written. Uh, we as a staff do not have a recommendation as to whether the board should or should not engage these banks, any number of these banks, under the policy because that is under the policy the sole discretion and authority of the retirement board. And with that, uh, Commissioner Myberger is the one who had proposed the two alternative motions. Uh, so I will turn the floor over to Commissioner Myberger. Uh, thank you very much. Excuse me a second. Yes. We don't have any. Okay. I know you're trying to help. I was going to do the same thing in terms of recognizing Mr. Myberger because this is his motion, so he will be answering all the questions. Not so. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you, Jay. I just want to make sure it's clear. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Myberg. You have the floor. Okay. Thank you very much. And thank you for calendaring this. Um, as loud uh, as possible for the folks outside. Sure. Uh, first of all, thank you. Um, I appreciate it being calendared, um, Jay, as well as uh, from uh, uh, Commissioner Pascoe Jordan. Uh, this is an uphill battle. I'm sure you understand this. Uh, let me put a few issues on the table in terms of why I am have put this forward. Uh, number one is we are fiduciaries. Everyone at this table, uh, the four remaining members, we are fiduciaries. We are here to manage the assets for the exclusive benefit of the members and their beneficiaries. And to me, it's obvious when, and this, is, this uh, dovetails on uh, Mr. Zeltzer's comments, that when a company pays a fine, in the case of Wells Fargo, $150, $175 million, in the case of the banks, billion, $7.3 billion, and a lot of fines, that hurts the value of our investments. These fines detract from the value of our investments. It is as simple as that. Um, it, I believe it parallels Sarbanes-Oxley as a result of 2002, where the heads of the companies had to take responsibility for their subordinates, which is why level one is on the table. Level one has to do with the chairmen of the board holding the simultaneous positions of CEO, Chief Executive Officer, and a member of the board, typically the chairman of the board. As an example, we have several different banks here, and, and at the uh, suggestion of the Executive Director, it's been brought to all of the banks that have fallen under the, um, that have <coughs> been cited by the Attorneys General, et cetera, in terms of those that have engaged or allegedly engaged with illegal, predatory, and racially targeted investments. This is wrong. I mean, this is not complicated. This is wrong. I mean, it's pretty easy. People try to make it complicated, but this is wrong. Sarbanes-Oxley says that the heads of the company have to sign off on the financial statements. To me, this is the same thing. If we're subordinates, if we are, if we are the managers and our subordinates do illegal activities, there should be some dealing with that particularly to make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, Stardust mentioned that here you have people that are, that, are, that are in service for the country, away there, and then they're losing their houses to foreclosures and laws have to be passed to, to cure them. This is wrong. It should be done. The banks are not going to act in your self-interest because they're beneficent. Okay, sorry. That's just not what the banks are. But to me, the issue turns on the fact that these are illegal, activities done by these investors, by these banks, there has been no penalties for that other than financial penalties. There's been no uh, activities based on the uh, people that run the show. And that's what level one is all about. And level one has to do, the short answer is too, it's too powerful. The, the heads of these companies have too much power. CEO and chair of the board. Jay Hewish is our executive director. Should we make him the president of the board? Now oh, come on, I'm, that's too much power in one person's hand. How could you be objective in that case? And on that subject, the level one says we want, to, we want to vote in favor of resolutions that call for the separation of the chair and chief executive officer, which is our policy. This is not new. This is our policy, and I've asked, I've asked staff on several different occasions to provide details on how we have voted in the past on that. But I want the positions separate. And it's not just chairman of the board, it's any position on that board. This is wrong, it's too much power in people's hands. And 
in addition to the CEO, the chairman of the board, Jamie Diamond is also a member of the Federal Reserve Board. This is wrong. Yes. Is this a conflict of interest? Here, yes. you saw a member of the board had to recuse herself for something that, to me, in my eyes, is less significant than having CEO, chairman of the board, and a member of the Federal Reserve Board. This is wrong. We have to take the power away from this. The, uh, that's number one. Number two is um, specifically against these people, the heads of these boards that serve as CEOs and members of the board. That we are, we hold proxies. Collectively, this pension fund owns about one uh, three hundredths of Wells Fargo Bank, J.P. Morgan, and these bank stocks. One roughly thirty basis points, three tenths of one percent of all the shares outstanding. We want to vote our shares and send a message that this is wrong. San Francisco is not the only fund. And let me read to you an email that was sent, and I provided this to uh, staff as well. This is from CalPERS, the California Public Employees Retirement System, $250 billion in assets, approximately 2% of the shares of these banks, 2% of the shares that are voting this way as well. Let me read your message. This is from Joe Deere. It was an email that I just summarized, but I, it says, Again, Joe Deere is the Chief Investment Officer, and uh, he says the following. I can assure you that CalPERS will vote to separate the CEO and board chair roles at Wells Fargo, J.P. Morgan, and every other company that persists in adhering to that poor governance practice. CalPERS will also continue to follow developments in the mortgage markets, including bank compliance with settlement agreements, and further opportunities to advance public policies that redress the harm suffered by homeowners. CalPERS. This is CalPERS. And that is copied to Henry Jones, the president of CalPERS Board of Administration, and Rob Fechner, the president of CalPERS Board of Investment. Okay, this is not this is coming from a very, very high level. Other public funds have similar policies. It's too much power in one person's hand. It is. That's what level one is all about. There's two other ones. Uh, point three is to vote in favor of resolutions that seek additional disclosure and or reform of mortgage lending practices. And number four is to vote no on executive compensation advisory resolutions. So that's level one, okay? Level two has to deal with more, what I would call engagement. And I heard uh, Mr. Zeltzer talk about divestment, that is selling the shares. Let me be absolutely clear, I am not in favor of divestment here, period. This is level one, which is voting our proxies. Level two is engagement. Level three is selling the shares, yeah, selling the shares. I'm not saying we should sell those shares. Let me be absolutely clear. I am not in favor of selling those shares. I'm in favor of engagement with these companies to obey the law. Is that complicated? To me, that's quite simple. That's really the substance of this. Number one, again, this is level two. Level one is to take all actions under level one. Number two is to call on these banks, okay, we've generalized this, to broaden it to all banks, not to number one, stop predatory and discriminatory lending practices. It's not asking for much, is it? Number two, to implement and disclose policies and practices to prevent recurrence of predatory and discriminatory lending. This is what policy boards are all about. Okay? Stop it. Don't do it anymore. Number three, this is a controversial one. Number three is to grant affordable permanent loan modifications to all borrower, borrowers who request them and who are entitled to such by the settlement with the estate's attorney general. Okay? They have to ask and they have to be entitled to that. Okay, we're not giving away the bar on this. They have to ask and they have to be entitled. That's all it is. Okay, it's not just giving money or giving uh, uh, anything else. Number three is to call on other institutional investors to join these actions. Again, similar as CalPERS, CalSTRS, and the other ones, as long-term passive investors. And number four is to safeguard the risks which contribute to the volatility in the markets. Okay? That is the substance of the resolutions. Okay. <laughs> While it may seem, obviously, it's generating a lot of controversy, um, but that's what it's all about. 
notice, and let me continue with um, the first black in the White House. Okay, we're talking about discrimination, racially targeted. I want to begin with, I want to continue with the quote from the first black in the White House. It wasn't Obama, so you know. It was uh, Frederick Douglass who said, power concedes nothing without a demand. Power concedes nothing without a demand. We are up against a tremendously powerful group of, uh, of, of people, the banks. Okay? I'm sure many of the board members perhaps have been solicited by various players here, urging them to vote against this. Perhaps, just a wild guess, Mr. Lazarus, just a wild guess. <laughs> the banks are very powerful. There's a lot of power behind it. There's a lot of money. Can I make it any simpler? The banks make money. That's what they do. And they do it well. That's what they do. So there's a lot of power. There's a lot of influence. There's a lot of money behind this. That's why this is a very, very challenging kind of thing we're up against. Power concedes nothing without a demand. These are very, very powerful people. Okay. Does Mr. I get part of it, let me uh, finish, then I'll open it up. Voting against the compensation, the compensation, is the head of Wells Fargo Bank or any other bank entitled to make $18 million a year? Is he entitled for a 10% raise over last year when overseeing on his watch this happened? No. And if our executive director or anyone else did illegal, illegal activity, I would want that dealt with. And that's what I'm asking for here. <coughs> the banks have settled. There are allegations, and I think substantive allegations. They are allegations. You know, they are. They're substantive. But come on, are you going to write a check for $175 million or $9 billion if there was something behind that? Now, come on. What I'm asking for today is, is simple. Number one is level one, which is the policy, voting against separation of the CEO position from the chair, from the board position, okay, which is um, coincident with our policy. Our policy says we should do this. So this is not seeking out banks only. This is consistent with our broad policy in terms of the separation of powers. Okay? Which made, this is good governance. This is what Mr. Deere was saying about following good governance. Okay, this is what it's all about. So those are my those are the, the reasons why I've calendared this. I appreciate, I know many of you have come here several different times to voice this. Thank you for your attention on this. And I think we owe it to our members, not just those that are here, but to all the members who are ethical, who want to receive their their pensions based on on, um, on legal activity. Let me also say that it's a challenge. Okay, I know this is not an easy thing to do. I'm sure there's a lot of power. I'm sure there's a lot of other things that want you not to do this. But it's very, very important. And I think it's important in terms of dealing with, with these issues. There have to be policy changes. Uh, those are my views on that. Um, I'm prepared to make a motion, but I think as a courtesy, I'd like to hear the viewpoints of other board members um, on this issue. for your time and for being involved. This is the most people that I've ever seen up at the retirement board since I've been here. 
granted, it's a, it's a pretty short stint. Um, five years ago, the financial markets took a, a turn for the worse, and the financial health of our pension system was, was called into question. Uh, today, the story could be different. We're back at near pre-crash highs in the financial health of our pension system. Looks good. Of course, the future is always highly uncertain, but things look better than they did five years ago. Our job as trustees is to protect and safeguard our pension system and the investments of our pension system, which pay your retiree benefits and those benefits of people who will someday rely on us for their financial security. Uh, what we try to do is minimize risk while maximizing returns. And investment risk can come in many forms. It comes in the form of business practices that our investments engage in. And those business practices can be risky, and they can make an investment a poor investment. As a trustee, uh, I'm very concerned about those business practices and any illegal business practices that would jeopardize the financial health of our pension system, retiree benefits, and the future of this system. For many people in this room, and just in general, uh, society, I know that our financial health is pretty closely tied to our monthly mortgage payments. And for most people, buying a home is generally the largest financial decision that any of us will ever make. But it's also an emotional decision. So for those of you who have had to go through foreclosure, I, I can only imagine the frustration of what that's like. I know I get frustrated when I just have to call my car insurance company just to file a simple claim. So I imagine you take that and you multiply it by and it's a whole different level of frustration. Um, to prevent this cycle from reoccurring and happening again, and for things, for the foreclosure process to happen all over again, real change needs to be effected. And the only real way to do that is through the legislative process. So for those of you who in this room have been in dialogue with the Board of Supervisors, your officials in Sacramento and Washington, D.C., I encourage you to continue down that road. I know some local politicians have taken an interest in this whole market cycle. But in the meantime, as our legislative bodies sort through this and figure out what's going to happen, we as trustees, as a board, will continue to closely monitor the financial health of our system and all the investments that are in it and their business practices. Thank you. Okay, with that, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, the motion to engage in level one and the level two uh, is made. I will not support it, colleagues. Uh, if it fails, I will put a motion forward for us not to engage. So it will be a, a, a statement from us. First, we have a proxy policy in place that covers most of engagement number one. Also, believe it's bad to call out particular companies or industries uh, as a body when we're talking about the investment. And that's pretty much why we have our proxy guidelines so we can set the path of prudent investing and responding to all of these things. The resolution calls out three banks. If we're going to do something, we do it to all of the banks. I mean, it's got to be collective. So that in itself is just a wrong way to do it. Uh, there is no doubt that what happened over the years is pretty shoddy. And I think it falls under underwriting quite a bit. You qualify someone at 2% and then a year later it goes up to 4%, and a year later it goes up to 6 Your payments double it the first year. And they're yeah. going up another third. Most people can't make that payment. But That's right. I believe the responsibility on the bank side on underwriting that and not writing it at a real interest rate. So they made a bad deal. But also, the person signing that note has some responsibility to themselves that they also know they can or cannot make that payment. And when you borrow money, there's two sides to the equation. I mean, maybe the banks have money, but the money is our money. It is a form of savings, and the bank has two ends of the bookend, as they say, on responsibility. Safeguarding the person that puts it in in a, in a uh, passbook account, and safeguarding it on the other end. And obviously we're here in the one end, but uh, for me, I understand that the person that puts it in as a savings account 
is driven by the bank doing the right thing to protect their savings account. The regulations that have been imposed after 2008 uh, collapse is pretty, pretty regulated. Uh, I don't think I want to sit here as a shareholder of a company and tell them a better way to come up with a new disclosure form or a new form of regulation. And I think uh, my colleague is correct that we deal with that legislatively and it's done smart and all the players uh, will sit at the table. So if there's a motion to go forward, I will speak against it and then I'm prepared <coughs> for a motion not to seek level one or not to seek level two. engage in level one or level two. Is there a second? Oh. Can we have a motion to 
we hear you, please? I'll move. He has a right to say something. I don't necessarily have to look at it. Okay. I will second the motion for the purposes of this question. My comment speaks for the already made your comments. Other comments from my colleagues, and I'll open up for the members of the public to share their views. Yeah. My bird would like to speak again. Um, <coughs> tell me the process. I would speak on the floor, then the, the members of the public. Have. After the board has finished coming, we'll invite public comment. Yeah, um, I want to speak against the motion. Um, when you do something wrong, there must be remorse or it's going to happen again. For those of you who support the motion, show me some remorse. Simple as that. How do we know this will not continue? How do we know this is not continuing? The other issue, again, and this is this is not complicated. This is not. We haven't seen any remorse by we haven't seen any firings of these people from these banks that, that have made these illegal racially targeted predatory loans they've been called out maybe they're still maybe they got raises I don't know but we have to and this is a policy making board I think we have to say very simply this is wrong and that's really what the motion is all about this is wrong because yes. If there is no remorse, it will happen. Okay? We talked about the legislation aspect. Well, obviously the legislation is important. Has it cured anything? Okay? If, if legislation is the avenue, then I don't think anyone would be here. It would be done. Yes, yes. So right. the short That's answer right. is yes, I'm sure it was well-meaning, but the legislative aspect has not worked. Right. And that's why we have to try something else. Right. Yeah. San Francisco has a reputation as being on the forefront of policy. Uh, San Francisco is the uh, first city to recognize Cuba. Uh, San Francisco is the first to have an emperor uh, for North. San Francisco is at, has been at the forefront of policy changes. If this fails here, I don't see any hope whatsoever, frankly, in changing these kinds of things. I really don't see any in terms of changing. I think we have to send a message that simply this is wrong. How do you say this is wrong? I don't see any simpler way. I mean, I, I think it's important. And let me also add, again, fiduciaries. I, as, as fiduciaries, we have the opportunity, the mandate, to maximize the returns. If there's illegal activity, I don't think that is maximizing the returns. If you pay fines, clearly that is indicative of you're not maximizing the returns. So I think in terms of our fiduciary aspect, that that is an important issue that we must manage the assets um, to maximize the returns. And I think people like ethical companies, don't you? I mean, I think we want to do that. And I, I, I think that's the key issue. And one last comment, um, as you know, I've been involved in the social policy forefront. I championed the cause uh, for uh, tobacco investment, uh, which incidentally was not unanimous. So, uh, uh, it's a challenge. I mean, it really, really is a challenge, but I think we have to say this is wrong. The reason why I, I championed the cause for tobacco divestment was this. A lot of the members don't like to get their earnings from companies that are killing people. <laughs> but it's lovely. Okay, and that was divestment. Okay, that's level three, divestment. Okay, so I, I think that is a similar kind of thing that many of the members don't like to receive dividends and earnings and capital appreciation and other kinds of uh, returns associated with illegal activity. This is wrong. The board must take steps to change that policy. We must solicit remorse. And I see many people from Wells Fargo, uh, perhaps in other banks, maybe that are in the audience, tell me remorse. I'd be glad to hear a remorse on this. Tell me, give me the assurance that this will not happen again. Very simple. So anyway, those, those are my final comments. Uh, 
before we call the public is supposed to make all that comments. Mr. Myberger links it to several other policies. And there is, we can always argue, therefore, what is, how are we fulfilling fiduciary duty when we're trying to minimize risk and maximize return in a safe way? So certain policies, for example, the tobacco policy, we have lost a certain amount of money with that policy. That's unfortunate. I don't particularly like smoking, even though I have to make a living eating smoke, so to speak. But that loss, that small financial loss, had to be made up by somebody. It was made up mainly by the city of San Francisco itself, but now because of the new fee sharing or contribution sharing by the city employees and the sharing, the active city employees will also pay a small piece of that <coughs> small loss. So every one of these policies that at least the investment has an effect. As for the issue of remorse, I guess one of the facts that sometimes we expect staff when they do research on any social investment policy is these issues of the allegations and whatever caused any of the banks to sign an agreement and pay a fine or settlement or redo their work. It's a very complicated lawsuit. But what does settlement really mean? Does it mean they were guilty of what they were accused of? Or did they make a business reason to just settle it and move on? It's always one of those arguments about settlement. I know the city often recommends the city go into settlements for that very reason, just to end the case. There's no judgment of guilt. If there's no guilt, why should people want to do remorse? Perhaps more importantly, it's not that remorse is worthless, but in, in a sense, one of the other items that Commissioner Myberg has spoke to, and so did Mr. Stansbury, about going forward. Will there be change? Will there be improvement so people know they can buy homes safely, they can stay in their homes safely, they can make other plans, since people use the equity in their homes to do many things, to include retire, putting their children through college, a whole host of reasons. It's their asset that they run their life around. So again, uh, in terms of voting for the level one and level two, I do not see where the case has been made that any of these banks are guilty of items that we need to tell them to change. I think the banks have already started the change long before this came. Why did they do that? The banks have their own reasons for running a intelligent, fair operations. They have their own reasons why they want to be a sustainable entity. But as for this issue of how this motion that is before us, voting no on level one and level two, yes, I am prepared to vote on that. There's no further comments, but we're going to open up to public comment. May just quickly uh, be a little more specific in my, my answer. I know some people thought I gave a little bit of a generic response. Uh, in terms of level three, I, like Commissioner Myberger, do not support divestment. Um, if at some point the investment became, these investments were risky and it was detrimental to our system, or there's some other extreme extenuating circumstances, and I think we can revisit that. Um, level two. I don't view the retirement system as a political body. I view the Board of Supervisors as a political body. They make resolutions that affect things not just here in this city, but outside the city and around the world. And I view our task as very specific. It is to invest city employees' money so that when they retire, that they have a secure retirement. Mm -hmm. In terms of level one, um, there are parts of level one that I, that I like and I agree with. I think that certainly a separation of power is, is an important thing, especially in terms of governance. Um, it's a check and balance, much like our government. But in terms of seeking additional resolutions and additional disclosure, um, the government's already been working on that. There are settlements with the Attorney General. There is going to be resulting changes that come from that. A again, it goes back to what I said about Level 2. I want us to be very specific and targeted in what we do, and it's an investment of your money, and not just your money, the other 50-odd some thousand people that are in the retirement system, and that we do it in a way that maximizes our return without pushing the political envelope. That's what politicians are for. We are here to guarantee the financial security of this trust. So for those of you who I think were wondering sort of where I stood on it, I wanted to be specific.
that. But I've got to recognize that we did get information from people who tell us not to do this for that very reason. They think we, we are not investing wisely by simply going level one or divesting. Okay. I'm not trying to speak for those thousands of people who do not want us to get involved in this. Okay, with that, uh, the motion's been on the floor. The board members have spoke. We shall open up to public comment. And again, I remember the rules. Try to bring your, re limit your comments to two minutes. If we have numbers. I will call out numbers. Please speak. Number one. Do you remember how you signed up on this list? And if you don't remember your number, no. you're going to have to go, go by name. We were supposed to refrain from saying names. It's okay. For, we, we, we thought okay. the numbers would be easier. For confidentiality reasons, we're trying to respect your right to maintain your identity. Okay, number one is Joe, excuse me, any of my pronunciations, Joe O'Hagan? O'Hagan. O'Hagan, thank you. He's Persian, he's not Irish. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Commissioners, my name is Joe Han, and I'm a Senior Vice President with Wells Fargo Home Mortgage in the servicing area, and directly responsible for community outreach. Could we please respect? I welcome the opportunity to be here today and really share the facts about our home preservation activities here in the city of San Francisco, the state of California, and nationwide. And I encourage you to vote down the resolution that's before you base on those facts. You already heard some of the inaccurate information around our foreclosure activity, around our home preservation activity throughout the state. So let me start by, by settling the rec setting the record straight from here. Wells Fargo has more than 25,000 mortgage customers in the city of San Francisco. 98% of those customers are either current on their mortgage or only uh, past due by one payment. From January 2009 through February 2013, we either completed or started to work out on 1,650 customers. 75% of those were loan modifications where we re restructure the mortgage and create a greater affordability for those customers. And about 23% of those customers were which uh, we did a short sale transaction or a deal of foreclosure, again, to avoid foreclosure. But over that same four year period, we had, or we completed 530 foreclosure sales. And to show you how that number really fits in with some of the numbers that you may have received before, if as has been claimed that there have been 12,000 foreclosure sales here in the city of San Francisco between 2008 and 2011, Wells Fargo is responsible for, for, for less than 5% of those sales. That's a remarkably low percentage when you consider the fact that over the last 10 years, we funded 17% 7, of all mortgage loans made in the city. L let me also speak about the loan modifications nationwide. Since 2009, we completed 844,000 loan modifications. Included in those restructuring is $6.4 billion of principal forgiveness. The majority of that has taken place right here in, in, in the city or the state of California. So with that, I'll, uh, I welcome any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hayen. Number two, Brad Blackwell. Commissioners, thank you for uh, having us here today. Uh, my name is Brad Blackwell. I am uh, Executive Vice President, and for uh, the past decade, I've been in charge of uh, national origination for Wells Fargo Home Mortgage. Uh, currently, I'm in the role of uh, Portfolio Lending Manager. And here's what I can tell you. You heard Joe's discussion of the, um, of the results. Wells Fargo has the lowest delinquency and foreclosure rate of any lender, any major lender in America and that holds here in San Francisco. The reason for that has to do, one, one major reason has to do with our, in 2004, was go, we were still in the, the, what you might call the go-go days, and Wells Fargo made a decision to issue a set of responsible lending principles and exit some of the very common practices or never enter into the common practices that were going on in the industry. One is the uh, stated income subprime loan. Uh, Wells Fargo did not do those loans. Uh, that has led to uh, better performance by our uh, customers. Second was the monthly adjustable negatively amortizing arms that were originated and you've read so much about. Wells Fargo did not do those. As such, we lost lots and lots of market share during that period of 2005 through 2008. Um, but we did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. Now. With a lot of allegations about uh, Wells Fargo being a discriminatory lender, I can tell you that um, first place, here in San Francisco, we have 85 people dedicated to home lending in this state, in, in the city. 
Every one of them is, is passionate about home ownership and sustainable home ownership. And by the way, more than 50% of our team members and originators are ethnically diverse, so, uh, as am I. 30 seconds. Um, and then, uh, as such, because after that period uh, occurred, Wells Fargo became the number one lender in the city of San Francisco. Last year, we were 21% uh, share of the, of the uh, city's market, providing homes and, uh, and financing for those people. Uh, for the people of, of our city. Second is that um, uh, we were even greater market share for ethnic minority uh, home buyers. And so, um, you know, we're, we're doing everything we can to outreach. You're going to hear from some of, the, some of our team members soon. Finally, uh, you, Mr. Blackwell. No. can I address the Justice Department? Sorry, Mr. Blackwell. Number three. Number three. Number three. Alfredo. Good afternoon, and thank you, commissioners, for the opportunity to address you here today. My name is Alfredo Pedrosa. I'm a native San Franciscan, and I do government relations for Wells Fargo. Um, I also, um, like Commissioner Brenda Wright, was targeted by Occupy and ACE um, at my personal home uh, because of my relationship and my, my job here at Wells Fargo. But I want to be here to tell you the true story of Wells Fargo's involvement in the San Francisco community. As you know, Wells Fargo is a national company with deep roots in California and a strong commitment to the city and county of San Francisco. Our company has been based in the city since 1852, and 3,100 of our team members are proud to call the city home and live in every single neighborhood in the city. We also have nearly 9,000 team members working in San Francisco and 41 bank stores in the city. In 2012, Wells Fargo team members volunteered more than 50,000 hours in support of schools and nonprofit organizations. Wells Fargo takes pride in the positive work we do in our hometown and across the country. <coughs> what we do in communities matters and makes a positive impact. Here are some of the highlights of how Wells Fargo makes San Francisco stronger. Team members from the Bay Area personally donated 12 million to schools and nonprofits. San Francisco team members donated more than 4.6 million. Over the past three years, we donated more than 60 million to Bay Area schools and nonprofits. More than 30 million was donated to organizations based in San Francisco. We made, uh, last year we committed a million dollars to the campaign for San Francisco General Hospital and Trauma Center, and we're the largest contributor to the Friends of the San Francisco Public Libraries, uh, building renovations in low-income communities. Last year, we donated 50000 to Mayor Ed Lee's San Francisco Summer Jobs Program, creating jobs and paid internship for low-income uh, low youth. And we also participated in creating affordable housing for um, veterans here in San Francisco in partnership with Sword to Plowshare and the Five. Town CDC. Thank you, Mr. Richard. <coughs> Number four, Miguel. Miguel. Miguel? I'll get one of these names right. right. Sorry, Miguel. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Miguel Bustos, and I'm a native San Franciscan born and raised in the Mission District. I'm a proud product of the Mission. I'm also a member of the board, I mean, member of the service employees, uh, that you, the investment that you, um, that you hold. I work for the city very proudly. Um, I'm in charge of the community outreach for Northern California, and it's my job to work with community groups, with faith-based organizations, government officials, to help people stay in their homes. Now I gotta tell you, believe it or not, we go way out of our way to try to reach everybody. Talk to us early and often, okay? Because we're here to help. We have, we have home preservation workshops. We've been involved in over 1,100 of our activities throughout California. You know, we hear a lot of people saying that, you know, we don't work with people. There are a lot of people on the Wells 52 that we have worked with. In some cases, we gave them an interest rate of 2%. I would love 2% loan, right? But it wasn't enough. 14, 12 out of the 14, I mean 12 out of the list have recently completed modifications. 10 have completed foreclosure sales. 24 are delinquent. Some, four of them are on active workout plans. Four were previously reviewed. 16 were reviewed and denied because of documentations. Six received modifications but then defaulted. 12 are equity home. Three of those lists are not even Wells Fargo loans. So I just got to say that, you know what? We are Wells Fargo. We are this city. We are these communities that we represent day in and day out. Really? Yeah, really. Respeto, mija. Respeto. Have respect, okay? All right? 
Okay, so look, we're here to help. But it works both ways, and we want to do that, okay? We, so anyway, as I was saying, as I was saying, look, we go out of our way to try to help people. We have events, we have home preservation centers where we invite people to come in. We are Wells Fargo, we are our communities, and we care about the places that we live and we work. Um, we've Thank never you. never been invited, never. Number five, James Luke. My name is James Luke. I've been with Wells Fargo and a member of the San Francisco Retail, or San Francisco Retail Mortgage Area Manager since 2001. More importantly, I lived in the San Francisco Bay Area since my parents immigrated in 1968 for all but a handful of years. My sales organization of 100 people is the most diverse in the country. They come from all works of life, walks of life and diverse backgrounds. They serve the communities as volunteers with numerous nonprofits and community organizations. During our annual community support campaign, I am proud to say that we consistently rank among the top mortgage areas, giving back financially to our communities. I am proud to work for Wells Fargo as our vision statement says, we want to satisfy all our customers' needs and help them succeed financially. It has guided us in our decision-making process to not offer products that were not consistent with our vision. It is a company that believes in giving back and helping customers succeed. This demonstrated in our corporate giving programs, our home ownership preservation events, our fair and responsible lending policies, and the day-to-day -day actions of our team members. As a person of Asian descent, I have felt discrimination firsthand. I've had family members and friends who have been taken advantage by less scrupulous lenders. It is with the utmost pride and confidence that I say that none of this happens, and more importantly, tolerated at Wells Fargo. Number six, <coughs> Diana Stouffer. Thank you, commissioners. Uh, my name is Diana Stauffer, and I am a branch manager uh, working with customers every day. Uh, our team, I'm here really to represent my team, and they're going to speak for themselves, um, puts customers in homes. We do purchase loans and refinances. And I, I'm proud to have joined Jim's team in September. Um, we cover a vast area in the city, and we're actively involved in the community. Um, not only do we uh, not only do we do that out of our own uh, time and volunteer hours, but also because being in San Francisco, our customers demand a good corporate citizen. They have many choices when they choose a lender, and we're proud to have them choose Wells Fargo. Um, one example, just to kind of give you a recent, uh, is that I recently joined the board of Rebuilding Together, and, and I hope to be active in that in the city. Uh, my team that's here with me today will be doing a build in the Bayview Hunters Point District just coming up in a couple weeks on April 27th. Uh, I just want to give you a real life example of some of the things that our team members do on a daily basis. We're real human beings. This is who works for Wells Fargo. Thank you. Thank you. Number seven, Greg Pennington. My name, my name is Greg. My name is Greg Pennington. I'm a loan originator. We did reserve seats for many people here in the front row who I believe are with the ACE group or the eviction group. Okay. No, I so we made speaker list. Ace. My name is. My name is first, come first sir. I mean, whoever came here first got on the list first. They my name is Greg Pennington. I'm a loan originator. I'm on the street trying to help people get into homes. I work for Wells Fargo. Um, I've been doing loans since about 1977. Previously, I owned a bank for about a decade that I sold in 2004. Um, for about four years, I was doing housing counseling one-on-one -on -one, um, with a lot of people in the community uh, trying to help people get into homes. San Francisco, and uh, working for SF Urban. And uh, know a couple of people that were in the room I saw earlier that I've worked with. I just want to let you know that when the doors closed and, and we're talking, a lot of the words you're hearing right now are the same words that are said behind closed doors. There's a lot of training that goes on. There is no mindset of, of trying to, to hurt people or get people out of homes. That is not happening. And a lot of you have gone through a lot of tough times and bad things. But the bottom line is this, that's just not happening at Wells Fargo. Those conversations are not being had. And when I was hired, I was brought on board and told I could do the same things and talk about all the things I did as a housing counselor. 
even to the detriment of sales. Talking about credit card debt and other areas that, that are basically against getting revolving debt, they told me I could do the same thing. And to be blunt, you, when you hear these other individuals stand up, that kind of stuff doesn't necessarily make me money. It doesn't work that way. But I just want to assure you, and I, I, I've been told not to take this personally, but I had choices of where I could go. I had choices of where I could go as a lender. And I went to Wells Fargo for just the reasons I told you right now. And I'll say it again, and specifically to you. When the doors are closed, that kind of stuff isn't going on. I'd love to talk to you one-on-one -on -one sometime about some of the comments you made earlier about the lawsuit, which I'm, because I've got, forgive me, big muckety mucks here, I'm not allowed to say in public, Very but serious. you ever want to get one-on-one -on -one and hear, hear the story of what's going on and the reasons behind that, more than willing, anytime. At what location, sir? Where, 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 what location? How about right after this is over? Okay. I, what I would suggest, Mr. Uh, Pennington, perhaps as you leave, if you want to hand out your business card. Sure. Okay, that's a maybe more genuine way of trying to communicate. He's obviously expressed his willing to talk to you. Um, folks, I just want to help you understand. We have a few other items on the calendar we need to get to today, too. So we have about a, another, at least another hour of speakers. So that's one reason we're trying to push this along. So sorry if I interrupt you. Okay, number nine, Isaac, okay, correction, it's Caesar Aravera. Oh, Caesar Isaac. You can go in order any order you want. I'll, I'll, I'll go. Okay, thanks. Hello, commissioners. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Isaac Gracia. I'm a mortgage consultant with Wells Fargo been working with the company for the last uh, six years and I've seen and done many things uh, for the community for my community the Hispanics first I started uh, in the uh, San Leandro Hayward where there are a lot of Hispanics and uh, uh, and people that work with me now I work in the mission area which uh, I've been you know actively looking and helping every single one of my customers, guiding them the right way. Um, that's the, the policy, the company, the, the, I'm sorry, the, the culture that I have, the culture that has my company. Uh, we have values. Uh, when a customer comes and asks me for a wrong product, I always try to find the right one for them. Uh, it's not just about, uh, you know, putting them in a house they cannot afford or they cannot uh, uh, pay. Um, the other thing is a, a refinance when a, a customer has a, uh, a fixed income and they cannot afford the payment. We, I always refer them to the right uh, area to take care of them. Uh, and like my, my coworkers say, uh, <laughs> please, folks, a little respect for the other speakers, please. There's been occasions when I cannot, uh, I don't get any, uh, uh, you know, uh, I don't get anything monetary talking, and I still help my customers. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Isaac Gavin. Oh, you're, you're, you're Isaac. So yeah. Let's listen. go back to get <laughs> Greg Caesar, excuse me, Aravena. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Hi everybody, uh, my name is Cesar Aravena and I'm a mortgage consultant for Wells Fargo, I, um, but I started with them in 2004 as a customer service representative. When I apply, I apply uh, to the mission stores. Why? Because I want to be more involved with them, with the community. I'm from Chile and I speak Spanish and I love to speak my language. Uh, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I will speak in Spanish in a little bit, but give me the opportunity. So um, I became um, a mortgage consultant and I stay, I stay at the mission stores. And I can say that I'm very happy because that gave me, or is giving me the opportunity to teach, to guide, and also to uh, give advice to my clients in their own language. And that build trust and loyalty. So whenever they look for me, I'm there, I'm there for them. And what else? Involving the community, uh, I can tell you that MEDA also, I'm going to be speaking there for the homeownership a seminar, but in Spanish, because I want to be there for my community. And I'm here just to, to speak about the great experience, not just 
working for Wells Fargo, but also working with my community. Thanks. Kathy Davis. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Kathy Davis. I'm the executive director of Baby Hunters Point Multipurpose Senior Services. And uh, we've been community partners with Wells Fargo Bank for the last 15 years. And I have to say, my experience with Wells Fargo has been extremely positive and very supportive of the work that we do. And right now, we are working on a $54 million senior center and senior housing project that was originally invested in by Wells Fargo. When nobody would give us anything, Wells Fargo gave us support on an ongoing basis, on a regular basis as a community partner. I can go into my Wells Fargo bank, I can hear about a senior that has a problem with their mortgage, and I can work with the bank to help that senior. So on a personal, individual level with Wells Fargo, they have been exceptionally good to work with, exceptional as philanthropists in the community of San Francisco, and the seniors in Bayview have benefited from their support. Number 11, Pastor Bryant. Good afternoon. Uh, Pastor Bryant uh, was not able to make it, but my name is Linda Sanders, and I'm a member of Calvary Hill Community Church. Um, we have partnered with Wells Fargo for over three years, and uh, I've actually, as a member of the church and a staff person, sat in on many of the financial workshops, um, and if I could just summarize, I believe the part that Wells Fargo played was to assist us in raising the consciousness level of our members and the community. Um, and what happened during those sessions, over eight workshops, is that people had a chance to ask questions. Uh, went over general banking uh, information, but in addition to that, uh, the Wells Fargo staff actually took time to work uh, with the community on people who are going through foreclosure, uh, requesting loan modifications, but I do know they sat down personally and had staff available. Uh, were all of the issues taken care of? No. But I can say this, that we partnered with them. They took the time. And this is a first. I was there. I witnessed. It's not something that I'm fabricating. Uh, we actually, we actually um, had members who said they benefited and were taken through the process and were successful in some cases. So we plan to continue partnering with uh, Wells Fargo. And just one other, one other thing is that not only were adults dealt with, but we had uh, youth who were introduced to um, some career development um, workshops, and this was like a three-year period. So we are still positively uh, partnering with Wells Fargo. Number 12, Gail Gilman. Gail Gilman, in case there's any folks in the hallway, no, okay. Number 13, Kibridge. Philip Kibridge? Yes. Hello, uh, Commissioners. My name is Philip Kilbridge. I'm the Executive Director of Habitat for Humanity, Greater San Francisco. Wanted to speak a little bit about uh, Wells Fargo engagement with our work because it has been transformational um, and has dramatically helped us improve our work in the community, helping us launch a home buyer readiness um, workshop series, um, not just in San Francisco and the Bayview and the OMI neighborhood, um, but also on the peninsula and up in Marin County. Um, additionally, they've helped us launch our neighborhood revitalization program, and this isn't just a financial investment since 1999, um, but an incredible investment of volunteer time and labor since 1999, and I will say um, 6,800 hours that we have tracked of volunteer labor from Wells Fargo team members helping us to build homes, helping us to improve the communities that we work in. 
Um, and most recently, um, we acquired a piece of land in the OMI neighborhood on which we are building 28 homes for and with families with very low and low incomes. Um, and the first folks at the door to help us invest and purchase that land was Wells Fargo. So I'm pleased that they have partnered with Habitat for Humanity Greater San Francisco and think that that should be recognized in a um, review of the social investment policy. Thank you. Number 14, Rosario Anaya. Good afternoon, Commissioners. My name is Rosario Anaya. I am the Director of Mission Language and Vocational School, a nonprofit workforce development organization that has been serving the Mission District and the City of San Francisco for the past 45 years. MLBS offers adult education and vocational training programs in healthcare and uh, hospitality, always integrating basic subjects like English, math, and computers, as well as running after school programs for at risk youth. Unfortunately, during the past five years, funds for adult education were drastically reduced. And before and during this time, Wells Fargo has supported job training and adult programs at MLBS, which serve primarily low-income, limited, and non-English-speaking Latinos and other underserved communities. Wells Fargo has been a partner of MLBS for vocational training, and many of our graduates have been hired by Wells Fargo, and some of them became branch managers. As important, and especially for community-based organizations, Wells Fargo has supported capacity building that is extremely important and valuable to organizations like MLBS. So I wanted to share with you the ways that Wells Fargo has been involved with our community. Thank you. Mitch. Zing Zang? I'm sorry. Mitchell Salazar. Salazar, thank you. Good afternoon. My name's. Do I need a, do I need a mic? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mitchell Salazar. I'm the director for workforce development for Mission Neighbor Centers, and I was asked to come and extend our support um, on behalf of our executive director, um, Sam Ruiz. Our agency has been in existence since 1959. We serve children, Head Start children, youth, and senior citizens, and do workforce development work. Our banking has been with Wells Fargo for the past three decades, and for the last 10 years or so, nearly 10 years, Wells Fargo employees have joined our board directors to bring their expertise to work with us in a collaborative and a fiscal manner. And in addition to that, when we have went out and sought their support for programs such as child care out in the Bayview with brick and mortar dollars, um, I was working on this project particularly back in 2008, 2007. Money was really hard to raise. At that time, the um, foundation extended support. And when we went back out to Wells Fargo to seek support to actually do services, they came back and helped us to, um, develop a family resource center and extended additional support to do workforce development. So on behalf of our organization, we did want to extend our support to the Wells Fargo Bank on behalf of our organization. Thank you. Number 16, Annie Chung. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, members of the board. I'm Annie Chung. I'm with a nonprofit organization called Self Help for the Elderly that started in 1966 in Chinatown. And we've been providing elder care services to almost 35,000 seniors in the Bay Area. I'm here, like other speakers before me, want to share our partnership and our experience with Wells Fargo. I became the executive director in 1981, and over the past 30 plus years, I have met many, many Wells Fargo volunteers who come over to serve on our board of directors, giving us advice and resources from the bank to help us do our work. These volunteers are people just like you and me. Uh, they have a job, but at their spare time, on weekends and weeknights, uh, they come over and serve with their heart uh, on nonprofit boards just like mine and just like Kathy's. And we know these people like our friends and our family. And whatever problems that exist, 
I truly feel that if you establish a relationship, you can go to them and discuss the problems with the Wells Fargo. We've had board members from executive level and we have volunteers who are just branch managers who <laughs> regularly come to our employment and training for older workers and teach them financial literacy uh, workshops. Six, a series of six workshops were done in our community last year and over 300 people attended and we're requesting the bank to come back and do more. Every year on Thanksgiving Day, we serve 3,000 seniors with a Thanksgiving lunch and Wells Fargo's team of 15, 20 employees are always there with us for the past 20 years. So I'd like to state our support and our relationship and partnership with Wells Fargo. Thank you. Number 17, Arna Safardi. My name is Arva Safdari and I'm with Urban Solutions. I'm here to read a statement from our Executive Director, Jenny McNulty, who could not be here today. Urban Solutions would like to address the positive impact Wells Fargo has on the community through their community development initiatives. For the last 10 years, Wells Fargo has funded Urban Solutions to provide services to low-income entrepreneurs and has consistently been one of our top funders. Urban Solutions provides consulting and training for entrepreneurs to start and grow businesses and create jobs. Their funding has made it possible for us to help more than 200 small businesses each year in San Francisco's low-income neighborhoods with a focus on the Western Edition and the Sixth Street Corridor in South of Market. 72% of, our, cli of our clients are people of color and just last year, our clients created 75 jobs and retained 54 jobs. Wells Fargo has been a strong partner assisting us with marketing our services and making grants directly to our small business clients through their storefront renovation program. Their team members have served on our board of directors and chaired various committees. Their support has made a big difference by increasing our capacity to provide services. Wells Fargo al also funds most of our peer organizations and I appreciate their philanthropic involvement throughout the San Francisco community. Thank you. Number 18. Emily Gassner. That's it. Yeah. Hi, I'm Emily Gasner. I'm the Executive Director for Working Solutions, and I'm here to talk about the partnership we've had with Wells Fargo over the past 15 years. It's been nothing but positive. Um, the people at Wells Fargo have truly cared about the success of our organization, and I can say that we would not exist if it did not, if it were not for uh, Wells Fargo. Um, Wells Fargo, when we wanted to start a microloan fund because we serve low-income entrepreneurs that want to start or grow a business but need access to small amounts of loans as well as education, advisory, and mentoring, um, we had no lending capital to lend out, and Wells Fargo took a huge risk in us and made the first investment of 500 so that we could make loans to low-income individuals in our community. Um, not only through the financial support of Wells Fargo, but through the team member involvement. We've always had Wells Fargo members on our board of directors, every possible committee. They um, host a number of financial education workshops throughout the Bay Area and always invite us to participate in those. And their team member involvement's really helped us increase our capacity as a very small organization with seven employees. And we just couldn't do it without Wells Fargo. Um, there's real human beings behind Wells Fargo and they really are care and have been very passionate about their involvement in serving low-income individuals, minority-owned businesses, and women-owned businesses, which are the, the groups of people that we serve. Um, thank you. Gladys DeWitt. Hello everyone, my name is Gladys DeWitt. I've been a city and county worker for 25 years. I'm sure all of you on the board have seen me four times now. Um, it's like we're just coming and nobody's listening. Sure, the guy said some of this is our fault. True enough, but at 43 years old, having $40,000 to put out on a home uh, in the Mission District on 20th and working at San Francisco General Hospital, uh, walking to work. Oh, yes, I'm a retiree. My money's in Wells Fargo. 
is in um, the retirement system. But um, let's see. First, it was Washington Mutual, Wycovia, and then Wells swooped up everything. The, the interest rate kept going up every year. I have never missed a payment. My payments go up twice a year. Uh, they told me if I miss payments, they would give me a modification. But at the same token, they're trying to steal my house because of the equity. I went to work with fractured back and worked. My house is not paid for, but now there's so much equity, uh, Wells Fargo wanted back. And they've locked me, they've locked me into a loan that I can't get out of. And if you're kicking folks out of their homes, are you going to give some of the people uh, a, a place to live where you got these projects that you're building with our money? This is our money. You know? Never miss the payment. Never. 500, dollars worth of equity, and I'm still, okay, and I'm in the mission. Mr. Nobody Mr. wants to talk Mr. to Mr. me. Time, please. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, you, you want to meet? Meet with Gladys. Meet with us. Miss uh, uh, Arguello seems to be the last name. Eric or Erica? Oh, thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of Eric. My name is Mike Smith. Um, I'm executive director at AIDS Emergency Fund and Breast Cancer Emergency Fund. We work with about 2,500 men and women in San Francisco who are disabled by their AIDS diagnosis or going through cancer treatments for breast cancer. Um, we provide emergency financial assistance, which for most people in a crisis means money for housing. 85% of the money we put out goes for housing. Wells Fargo has been our single largest financial backer for 30 years. They are the single largest donor to our agency. We, over the years, probably have worked with 25 different senior executives at Wells Fargo, all of whom, on a very personal level, many of them served on our board, on a very personal level, they care about housing. They care about keeping people in their homes. The money that we've received from Wells Fargo over those years has gone to stabilize the living situation for tens of thousands of San Franciscans disabled by AIDS who are living on Social Security and trying to make ends meet in this town. Um, I believe strongly in the work that Wells Fargo does in the community. They are an extraordinary community advocate and community partner and we love them. Yeah, okay, now, thank you. Number 21 is Kathy Davis, but you already spoke. 22 is Phil Kilbridge, you've already spoke. Not on the same, not on the same item. On the same item, they spoke in general comment. No, no, they've spoken they on this. On this they speak twice. No, he's, if it's on this item, then he's right. They have spoken already on this item. That's the rule correct. is limited to once per item. Right. Those rules were read at the beginning. Excuse me, Miss. I just was <coughs> requesting. I had I signed up on number one and two too, and our my page was put underneath. So I was just wondering. I want to make sure it hadn't got lost. What is your name? I'll try to find it while the next uh, person is speaking. Well, actually, Harry Baker was the person, the first person on it. He was number one on, on the list. So they, the, the Wells Fargo put people put it way underneath, and then uh, we got it again. So we're number one too. I see your name. I'm yeah. on that list. Or, yeah, okay. it's yeah. very vague. It has not gone away. It's on the next page. That's the way this is working. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure it's 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 So hopefully all the Wells Fargo people will be staying to listen to all our comments as well, of course. Okay, uh, excuse me, Mr. Starburst. Uh, Stardust. Stardust, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Number 23 is Monica Kenny. Whoa. <laughs> First and foremost, I'd like to say to Mr. Myberger that good governance does include divestment. Um, SPURS should be acting in the public interest. They should be doing the right thing and adhering to their own policies. You are not supposed to be investing city workers' money in institutions that carry out racist practices, as Wells was specifically fined $175 million for. This is not just about investment health. Fiscal health with, begins with investments in healthy institutions, and it has been shown via the Security and Exchange Commission and as well as the Department of Justice that these banking institutions are not contributing to the health of our society and our nation at this time. Any person who receives a paycheck or who is on the dole 
from Wells Fargo is of course going to sing their praises. If I received a paycheck from Wells Fargo, or if they were supporting my community desires, then I would be singing their praises as well. However, uh, when I stepped away from my job as a city worker at a wastewater treatment plant, as a maintenance mechanic who was being rained uh, upon by feces and urine every day working for my city, I went to Wells Fargo and I said, look, I've emptied my retirement, I've put every penny into this house, and I need help with a modification. When they finally said that they had a modification or, or a forbearance agreement in place for me, they turned around the following day and sold my home at auction. I had a meeting with Mr. Alfredo Pedroza, who sits here in my supervisor's office, at which time he pleaded that there were no cases like this that Wells Fargo could refer back to, that this was not occurring. I am a real person too. And my entire life, my only desire was to buy my home and live out my life in San Francisco. I got hit by a car when I was nine years old. I took the $25,000 that I had from that and I put a down payment on my house. Yeah. We're calling on every SF public office to pressure these banks to write down hundreds of millions in principal that was illegally inflated by the banks in the first place. Mr. Driscoll, you are not a fool. You have a great pension. You decided to work for your city and to put your life on the line. Now, we should not take your money and invest it with banks who have been, have been shown to be uh, committing nefarious, predatory, and racist acts against the community. Here at SFers, we're calling on the passing of these resolutions as, as, as an honest step towards the board adhering to their own policies. Thank you again, Mr. Myberger. Um, in my case, it's been shown that Wells illegally foreclosed on my home. They are still guilty of dual tracking. They are still guilty of providing multiple single points of contact. And they are documenting their own violations to the Homeowner's Bill of Rights, which was passed down through Kamala Harris in order to attend to this situation. Now, again, any person that is getting a paycheck is going to sing the praises of whoever is writing that check for them. We are again asking that you just take one step in saying that if you are a CEO, you should not be sitting on the board of, of a group that is, is determining the lifeblood of folks who work for the cities. You know, I'm, I'm having feces rain down upon me because I believe in what I do and I believe in water quality and I want good water quality for my city. But you know what? Don't put my money in with Wells Fargo when they specifically lied to me and said, we didn't receive your hundreds of pages of information that I have copies of, that I have the, the uh, cards of the folks from the, the uh, branches that I faxed all this information from. Without the, the involvement of Nancy Pelosi's office, Wells Fargo would not have adhered to the forbearance agreement that they set forth with me in writing without the involvement of having Mr. Pedroza come in and lie and say, oh, this, things like this never happen, without the involvement of my supervisor, I, I wouldn't be standing here today. And I'm gonna continue to fight for my home. I think this is a multi-headed monster and we need to attack it from all angles. Number 24, Marguerite Young. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Marguerite Young. I am with the Service Employees International Union's Capital Stewardship Program. Um, my job is to participate uh, in uh, the deliberations that pension boards all over the country make around um, responsible investment of our members, uh, 800,000 members in public uh, pension funds. Um, of their investments. I spend a lot of time paying attention to corporate governance and the uh, interpretation of what fiduciary duty is. Um, I have witnessed our members' uh, retirement accounts plummet after 2008. And with due respect to Mr. Stansberry, while they may be back to where they were in 2008, they're not where they should have been in 2013. Um, we have not made actuarial progress in the last five years. Um, we have barely made any progress in the last decade. 
that is part and parcel due to the financialization of our economy and the financial sector with the banks at the head of the pack. So while we are acting today on the specific uh, predatory uh, practices that are called out in the board's social investment policy, what I actually ask you to do today is act in your fiduciary duty. Yes, the legislature has a role. Yes, the courts have a role. But yes, you have a role as fiduciaries to manage and, and take account of the risks that your portfolio has and to understand and to engage where necessary to deal with those risks. CalPERS, CalSTRS, New York City, New York Common, North Carolina, and the list goes on, have voted in favor of separation of chair and CEO, have voted against uh, pay packages that are outrageous, have voted in favor of mortgage servicing resolutions that call for disclosure and auditing. Get into the 21st century, San Francisco. You're, get out of a windowless room. Allow people who ask to be here to be able to participate when you were given notice. And you agreed to give us room, and you did not. Thank you. Thank you. Number 25, Jim Lazarus. Thank you, Commissioners. Jim Lazarus, San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, uh, 1,500 local businesses from throughout the city. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today and to urge you to support uh, Commissioner Macris's uh, motion and to oppose the original motion that was uh, presented. Uh, I think what you've seen here is a uh, outpouring of really outrage by the business community over unfair attacks on local companies. These are banks that employ thousands of San Franciscans, our neighbors, our friends, and the whereas clauses were so out of touch with the reality of what happened. Uh, the banks that you might be targeting don't exist anymore because of their subprime mortgage policies. Where's Wachovia? Where's Washington Mutual? Where's Countrywide? They're not here because those were the banks that caused, in large part, the financial meltdown that occurred in 2007 and 2008. The federal government asked Wells and Chase and Bank of America to help pick up the pieces. We should be proud that we've got an economic house coming back into order because of the banks that remained after the crash. So we urge you not to take this policy, not to target local industries. If you have policies on proxies and how you're going to vote those proxies generically 30 seconds. on all companies of which this pension plan is invested in, so be it. But don't target unfairly local businesses, local employees. Thank you. Number 26, Guillermo Lainez. My name is Guillermo Lenes. Um, I'm an organizer with Tenants Together. We represent 15 million tenants in the state of California, many of whom used to be homeowners, many of whom used to own Wells Fargo homes. They're no longer in their house because the bank has refused to allow people who, for whatever reason, uh, can no longer hold on to their home to stay in that home. You guys do not have the same policies as uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac that allows for a period of time for, for tenancy after the loss of foreclosure. This affects the fabric of our community. It really destroys what we value here. When you talk about the mission, sir, you talk about the people that live there. The people that love their home, let them stay. You lose nothing. Yeah. You make money as a, as a landlord. Now, I'm supposed to read a letter from my AD. I'm supposed to tell you guys that um, CalPERS and CalSTRS already divested in a, from a scheme that was very similar in East Palo Alto, where folks were be being evicted. I'm also supposed to tell you guys that you guys are opening yourself uh, up for potential liability as we know that some of these uh, practices are fraud. And you guys as investors will potentially pay some of those costs. Uh, so the, the employees at the city should not have to pay for that. But I, I lost a home to foreclose, foreclosure from Wells Fargo. So I'm passionate, I'm angry, and I get absolutely incest when I hear people who are well-meaning tell you that because they got a few pennies now this bank is supposed to be great. Well, I have this letter, I'll give it to you. I'll let you guys uh, read 
from the executive dir director at Tennis Together. Uh, he is a very calm person. I clearly <laughs> am not, because what's happening here is outrageous, and you guys should be mad. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Donaldson. My name is uh, Ed Donaldson. Um, you know, I've just been sitting here listening to the conversation, and it's very interesting. Um, we seem to find ourselves polarized, and we're stuck off in these uh, corners, and we're not really looking at uh, what we can do in terms of helping to stabilize families and to bring more solutions to the table. I am a former HUD approved counselor. Uh, I work with many of the people that are here. I work with countless seniors uh, who could not be here today. And I witnessed a lot of what was wrong with this whole, you know, crisis and, and whatnot. And, you know, for me, being a finance person, I also worked as a trader on the Florida Pacific Stock Exchange. Um, I was there in 1986 when the market crashed. I was present during the SNL crisis uh, when that whole thing played out. And I witnessed firsthand what the strategies were that were used to stabilize communities. It wasn't an either or conversation. It was people sitting down, putting their heads together, and working through this stuff to find a solution that kept people in their homes. And, I, and I'm saddened, because I'm, li I'm listening to this either or kind of conversation, and I'm frightened and afraid that we're going to continue to be in this situation, um, you know, polarized, until we can figure out how, you know, cooler heads can prevail and sit down and find answers. The final thing I want to say is, is that, uh, you know, I study this stuff all day, every day. I work with uh, a community stabilization organization that is actually working on a national level doing strategies to keep people in their home. Um, there are currently 5.2 million homes that are in some stage of default. If the current rate of foreclosure success continues, which is about 25 percent, approximately 3.9 million of those homes are going to end up in foreclosure. And I ask the question, what's going to happen to those families? You know, so let's put a human face on this. Let's let cooler heads prevail. And let's sit down and let's figure this stuff out. That's Thank you. Right. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Number 28, Lynn 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 Eggers. Eggers, thank you. Lynn Eggers. I'm a retiree from the city. Hi, I'm a retiree from the city. I hear the tale of two cities here today. Wells Fargo is brilliant with foundations and things, and maybe that's true, but I have lots of neighbors that have been foreclosed upon, and I've seen the runaround they've gotten from bank officials, lost forms, over and over they've gone to huge conferences to help them keep their homes. Something is not right here. There are two big pictures that really are totally opposite. Um, I took my money out of Chase. I don't know where Bank of America and Chase are. They didn't get an invitation to come. <laughs> I, I don't quite get that. I took my money out of Chase because I got sick of seeing people lose their houses, and I don't want my retirement money to stay in banks that are like this. Thank you. Number 29, Susan McDonough. My name is Susan McDonough. I am an active member of ACE and Occupy NOE. Um, we've been here four times, as you know, taking up a lot of time. Uh, so I have two points. One is I'm not going to disparage the money that Wells Fargo gives away to many good organizations. That's not the issue. They are the wealthiest bank in San Francisco and uh, one of the wealthiest in the country. I feel it's their obligation to give away money to community organizations. So that's not the issue. For me, there's two issues. One is, you have policies in place, you should put those into practice. It's as clear as that. There are, there is documented evidence of predatory and illegal and racist lending. And second of all, uh, we've been here four times now, and I am very disappointed I was told in a meeting with the executive director and with uh, Commissioner Macris that we would get a bigger room. And we warned you, and you asked me for numbers, and I called you and gave you that information. This is not transparent. We have people outside, can't get in this meeting. OK, there's three seats that Wells Fargo people have left for you if you want to come in. But 
you told us, you assured us that you were going to find another room. You said, oh, we can get a room at City Hall, no problem. It, it's always, uh, it's easy to do. And here we are in this stifling little room. I feel it is a complete uh, disregard for public input, for San Franciscans, for retirees to be able to participate in their own retirement system. Thank you. If there are some uh, empty seats out there, we could mention to the people in the hallway, it's, this is a time to come in and sit down without interrupting the speaker. We're not moving right now, okay? Thanks for the suggestion. We're trying to carry on with the meeting. Thank you, Mr. Welcher. Please, Mr. Welcher, let the people sit down so we can carry on. Excuse me? Can they sign up? Yeah. Some may have the option. Don't worry, we'll cut, we'll, at the end, I'm going to give those people the option. Number 30, Molly Martin. Hi, my name is Molly Martin. I'm a retired San Francisco city and county worker. So this is my retirement fund. Well, when people told me, or when I learned that the, the board of this fund is composed partly of bank executives who are making decisions about investments in their own banks. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> I just didn't believe that. How could that not be illegal? Isn't there a law against that? Well, it's a conflict of interest for sure. And, and I think that Mayor Lee must understand that. Don't we all understand that that's a conflict of interest? <laughs> we do. <laughs> Anyhow, I, I, so I'm outraged <laughs> because of that. And I, I feel like the people who are part of the retirement system ought to be involved in these meetings. And that's why I'm here. Also because I've been um, personally interacting with people who are losing their homes. My neighbors have been um, evicted and their homes have been auctioned off, sometimes without their knowledge, while they thought they were working on a loan modification, and Wells Fargo has been at fault. I don't know how you can explain that, but you know, try to imagine what it's like to be, to lose your home and to not be seconds. able to get your home back. It seems like Wells Fargo, and I know they've been throwing money around San Francisco for many, many years. I can see that. And it buys many things. And it seems to me that it's bought our retirement system. And I object. Thank you. Next one is Steve. He's with UP. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, one, of the issues here, like, or one of the issues here that we're talking about really is capitalism. That's what this system is. And the banks uh, are, in pro are in business to make a profit. That's what everybody says here. And uh, the, fa the fact of the matter is, is capitalism is not working for people in this country. That's a fact. Now, my view is, is that uh, I don't want to make the banks better. I don't want to make the banks, but I don't think the banks are going to be better because banks are about making profit. That's it. And the banks are about also pushing deregulation. When you talk about what, what caused this crisis, what caused, what's it all about? Well, weren't these same banks, the Bank of America and Wells Fargo and Citibank pushing for deregulation in our country to get rid of Glass-Steagall? Who was doing that? Who was pushing that? It was the banks. And I found it astounding as a city retiree that we've got the bankers on our retirement board who are voting on investments in businesses that they have stock in. I mean, how can you be there sitting here and say that you don't have any, uh, uh, any kind of interest when you have owned bank stock? You think that's equitable? You think that's equitable? Of course your decision is going to have some effect because you're going to be saying to the banks, you need to do something to change the way you operate. I mean, if CalPERS has done that, why is it this board can't do that? Is CalPERS such a radical organization? <laughs> Revolutionary organization? Hell no. 
Hell no. I mean, to separate the CEO from the chairman of the board, is this such a radical decision? But it seems you have a big problem with that. Well, frankly, I think the city employees need to clear out and clean out our trustees. We need to get some trustees who reflect the people. And we need to get a public bank in San Francisco and California where we can put the money and the interest, the direction of the bank is not for the profit of billionaires, but for the people of the city and the people of the state to make us healthy. Because we are not a healthy society. We have mass unemployment. We have people losing their homes. We have people dying in the street who can't get health care. And this bank, the Bank of America and Wells Fargo, are pushing for charters. You said you were giving money. How about giving money to City College? We are cutting classes. Thank you, Mr. Bernetta Adolph. Hallelujah. Um, my name is Bernetta Adolph, and I would like to remain seated. I would like to remain seated. Um, <clears throat> I am a 66-year-old senior. I've uh, been through a lot, cancer, blindness, and just still fighting to stay in my home. Now, in the beginning, I, I think a lot of breakdowns start in the beginning. Wells Fargo wouldn't even talk to me. I tried for months and months, so they had no idea what my problem was because I was sent from place to place to place. And, you know, after they wouldn't talk to me, I just started fighting to stay in my home. But I don't want to stay there. What I want to say is it's great. It's really great that you're helping the community. We love it. But that's not the problem. And, um, you know, these are things that we already know what you said today. In fact, I woke up one morning to a big ad with Brenda Wright telling about all the nonprofits that were helping. That's not going to help us. I mean, I, I, I appreciate that. But I think, what if you had taken the money that was paid on that ad and put it to help a 90-year-old woman who lost her husband? You know? I mean, this is real out here. And you people, you're really not, you, you're not taking the time to listen. I wish all of the people in trouble had spoke first, because you get tired. And a lot of times, well, Fargo people are, oh, <laughs> okay. And the other thing is, okay, you're, you're beautiful. You didn't have this problem. These other banks did. But it was World Savings, World Covid, and you. But you have to take the responsibility, because you have those. There are, are, are loans hidden in trust. But you're not taking, it, I mean, you, you're, it's illegal foreclosure. You can't even foreclose on them. But what? Everybody is together, so you, you're able to do it. And I'm really outraged. Okay. Okay. Number 33, Elliot Katz. By the way, she's getting put out her house. Do you want to take some of my time? <coughs> um, I was going to say ladies and gentlemen, but gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen here. Uh, I appreciate uh, the people for the community speaking for their own, uh, for the, the good, the little bit of good that Wells Fargo did. Um, uh, at the and I've been in your place. Uh, I'm the founder of the organization that currently puts on the Ethnic Dance Festival that was created to give balance to the minority communities some 35 years ago when the hotel tax fund was sending ev almost all their money <coughs> to the uh, opera, ballet, and symphony and literally giving nothing to the, uh, <coughs> to the uh, minority groups. <coughs> I'm seeing a <coughs> kind of rerun of this situation here. <coughs> uh, and you're, you're hearing, you're not hearing. This thing was literally stacked. You heard complaints that there's not enough seating. The people from Wells Fargo came in earlier, took up your energy, as was pointed out. My feeling is that this be, this be put on. As I sat there, it was obvious from the looks on your faces that uh, the original uh, uh, recommendation was going nowhere. It's, they're still looking at it. It's pretty. So, but I don't think you've really seen and heard, heard from the people who are, who are really being touched with this situation. If you've heard from some of them, there's a lot more. And uh, I really do think uh, so the, the suggestions, 
30 seconds. Uh, the suggestions that have been forth are, are well worth doing. You haven't heard from the president or CEO of Wells Fargo who gets $18 million a year. Have him come in and ask for uh, you guys to be patient and kind. You know, I, I was part of the civil disobedience actions against apartheid on a UC Berkeley campus. And what this is, it's almost like a repeat of the same kind of thing. This is a horror story. And you won't realize the depth of it until you give their people here an opportunity to really give their personal stories. Thank you. Thank you. Number 34, Mr. Buck Baggett. Uh, I sat at the Lights Neighborhood Center. We've gotten loads of uh, Wells Fargo dollars, long-term housing tax credit grants. I got asked by a nonprofit to run a gang of drug dealers out of Buchanan Park in the Western Edition. Wells Fargo was the only group that funded it. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about here today. Like Ed said, it's not an either or. We think you should put more money into San Francisco, not less. We've been hearing about the 50 million you're gonna to give to Hope SF for the last three years. Every time any of us approaches Mayor Lee, it's oh, they're gonna put 50 million to Hope SF, put it in already, okay? <laughs> totally two different issues. We have people that are getting burned. And Miguel, we'd be glad to sit down and talk with you about it. And you. fine, there you go. That's how, that's how open you are to talking with us about it. Yeah. 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 We were yelling at them. They can yell at us. It's cool. Um, or they can yell at me anyway. But look, two different issues. Um, and we're not going to stop. And, and, and Victor, I don't know what you're smiling at. You're voting with the other side. Um, but in any case, um, we're not going to go away. I don't know how much we're going to waste our time with you people anymore. But I do think it's interesting, Mark, that two-thirds of the mayor's appointees can't vote on matters affecting financial institutions. Talk about the, the, the fox guard and the chicken coop. 20% of your investments, I believe, are in banks. And two-thirds of the mayor appointee, mayor's appointees, if they do what they should, will accuse themselves every time. Wells owns this board, even the two of you that run. Thanks. My name is Ian Haddo, and I'm glad to report I'm a Chase mortgage holder. I spoke to you three times previously, and you granted me your attention, and I'm grateful for that, because attention is an increasingly rare commodity. Our attentions are all divided. I am culpable of that. Uh, so I'm not speaking as holier than thou. But I am respectfully requesting of you that you be attentive to your policy regarding socially responsible investment. And I wish to comment about a statement you said, Mr. Myberger. You spoke about lack of remorse. I recently contended with somebody who I didn't know was a sociopath, but I suspected so, and I didn't know exactly what sociopathy was, so I researched. And I learned that one of the traits of sociopathy is lack of guilt, shame, and remorse, which are the brake pedals of personality. And because the sociopath lacks guilt, shame, and remorse, he or she or the culture, the institution, the society is especially resistant to change. The individual, the society, does not recognize that he's doing wrong because he doesn't feel it and he doesn't recognize he's a sociopath. But that doesn't 
mean that the people or the group are not necessarily doing wrong or acting to the disadvantage of society. Thank you. You've already spoken. That takes us to Peter Fairfield. That's a leave. Yeah, okay. Leave. okay. Uh, 38, 39 across top. Number 40, Claire Zvansky. Hey, Claire. Excuse my back, Norm. Thank you very much. Um, I'm here really to speak to you today as colleagues, three of you who ran for election. And actually, I've known Victor for a long time, and there are a number of other people um, that I've known from the city. But I, I am representing the um, West Bay retirees, SEIU 10 to 1. But I am also an elected commissioner on the Health Service Board. And I've been doing that since 1987. And the reason I came today to speak to my colleagues is that this is primarily an issue about membership. This isn't just a socially responsible issue. You did that with South Africa, Sudan, tobacco, firearms. This is about members, our members, the people I represent, the people you represent, that are being specifically harmed. If you want to look at regulation, the laws that are now on the books are prospective. They don't help anyone who has been through this process or who is going through the process, they only will start to protect those who will begin part of a new process. Variable interest rates, before I worked for the city 40 years ago, I did real estate. We had savings and loans. They started variable interest rates. Curious to me that most of the people who were given variable interest rates were people of color because regardless of what we all know, that hardworking people of color would have good credit, they were given variable interest rates because their credit was deemed um, not good enough. We've had wage freezes, cuts. Um, no one has really worried about the impact of those wage freezes and cuts on our members and what the impact has to do with how they live and their homes. We have people who are serving in the military who have lost their homes. They're all city employees. They are your members. They are my members. This is not so much social investing this is membership please represent our members think again before you vote thank you Number 41 tony robles hi uh, <clears throat> i represent senior and disability action we're a organization that advocates uh, for seniors and people with disabilities uh, we advocate uh, for uh, better and more health services so that elders and uh, people with disabilities uh, can age in place in December we divested uh, our money completely from Wells Fargo Bank um, in response to the foreclosure crisis and uh, I'm here in solidarity with people that are going through it uh, the sister in front, sister here, young lady on the right, uh, who are making the voices heard today. Our organization, uh, Senior and Disability Action, we're very much influenced by the foreclosures and evictions of some of our members, as well as a document that was published in uh, July of last year by AARP uh, in their Public Policy Institute. Uh, the report was called Nightmare on, Ma on Main Street, Older Americans and the Mortgage Market Crisis. The study concluded that no age, group, race, or ethnicity was spared from the effects of the declining home values and financial difficulties of the Great Recession. Despite the perception that older Americans are more housing secure than young people, millions of older Americans are carrying more mortgage debt than ever before, and more than three and a half million are at risk of losing their homes. Uh, a little more than 3.5 million loans of people uh, age over, uh, over the age of 50 were underwater, translating into no equity. Uh, over a half a million loans of people over 50 were in foreclosure, and another 625,000 loans were 90 days or more uh, delinquent or in default. Um, you as investors, long-term investors, I know you care about the health of our overall economy. Uh, we urge you to vote in your proxies uh, in ways that support reform, urge the banks and major banks 
uh, in particular to end foreclosures, provide, provide permanent loan modifications to borrowers, implement and disclose practices and policies which will prevent the recurrence of predatory and discriminatory lending, and safeguard uh, SFOs from risks associated with other banking practices. Thank you. Harry Baker. Thank you. That was a long wait. Um, uh, uh, thank you for all of you being here. Uh, these are important issues in front of us. My name is Harry Baker. Uh, I retired uh, about 12 days ago. Before that, I was uh, a member of the Executive Board of SEIU 1021 and a delegate to the Labor Council. Um, I come bearing letters. I have a letter from the Labor Council uh, and also a letter from SEIU 1021, and I'll give those to you, uh, Mr. Driscoll. Um, or actually, someone up here has offered to take them. And they are addressed to uh, Wendy Paskin Jordan, and there are uh, copies uh, sufficient for the rest of the members of the board. Um, SEIU is the, uh, currently the largest union representing uh, SFERS active members and of SFERS retired members, the largest number of those come from SEIU local unions. Uh, the, the, the point that I, I want to, to focus on is what happened to Bernadette Adolph and Gladys DeWitt, two African American women who were given subprime loans by Wells Fargo. Um, and now are fighting to stay in their homes. Let's remember what happened with Wells Fargo on, on July 12, 2012. The Department of Labor sued Wells Fargo for $175 million. It paid it uncontested. Uh, it was charged with having steered 34,000 qualified African American and Hispanic mortgage applicants into subprime loans, just like these two women got. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you. be excused for a moment, he will return. Number two, Kay Walker. We can't. Uh, Joe, 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 we, can't. we, we don't have a quorum with uh, Commissioner Stansbury out, so. I thought we were allowed you to take testimony. We cannot vote without a quorum. Right. Well, you, this, this, is this, can't public be, this is public comment. It can't be part of the record without Commissioner Do I wait? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> It'll be a minute. <laughs> Hopefully this will only take two minutes. Norm, do you have the handout that Harry was going to pass out? Can I see that? Do you have some letters? Can I give it to you now? <laughs> now is a good Not have had a chance to sign up. 